Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to our webinar today. This is Box Tree Moth Training for 2023. My name is Cassie Russell. I am the Nursery and Landscape Specialist with OMAFRA and I'll be your host today. Uh, we do have a relatively short webinar for you all, just hoping to provide a refresher on box tree moth, focusing on how to scout for BTM and some management options available in Ontario currently. Uh, this is a timely topic since BTM was recently listed as a regulated pest in Canada. Um, at the time of, the, of us recording this, uh, the on Ontario is the regulated area. Um, and we're expecting in the coming days DFIA to be releasing a new directive on the movement of boxwood outside of regulated areas, so in other words, Ontario. Uh, so we hope this webinar can serve as a training tool for growers, nursery staff, as well as folks in the green industry. All that said, uh, I would like to introduce our main speaker today, Abby Wiesner. Abby is a Master's of Science candidate at the University of Guelph, uh, and she's been working with box tree moth since about 2019. Abby has had many field seasons under her belt. Uh, scouting for BTM has also done some work on host preferences of box tree moth and insecticide efficacy trials. Um, and currently, Abby is finishing up her master's and working with Homafra as the canola and edible bean specialist. Uh, so with that, Abby, I'll uh, I'll uh, give it over to you. Thanks. Uh, you can get your screen share sharing going, and uh, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Cassie. Just checking that my screen share has come up and everyone can see that. We're all good. Great. Thank you for that um, introduction. And I'm really happy to be here to talk about this today. Um, to make everything a bit simpler, I'm going to turn off my video as well. And then we'll come back and answer all of the questions at the end. But just to get that started, let's dive right in. So uh, box tree moth, or BTM for short, is a species within the Caramidae family, which is otherwise known as the snout moth family. This is the same family as the European corn borer, which is a, another agricultural pest. BTM is native to East Asia, but was first confirmed here in Ontario in 2018. Research conducted since that time, which I was involved with um, has confirmed that there are two complete generations per year in Ontario. I'm going to walk through all of the different life stages, um, which you can see just pictured here uh, with the different photos above. But before that, let's just talk about the distribution. This map is up to date and current as of last year. Any of the areas that you see on the map, which are red, either the red dots or the boxes that have red outlines indicate a positive location for BTM detection. Back in 2018, BTM was originally detected in Etobicoke, which is a district of Toronto. Um, but as you can see, since that time, BTM has a uh, spread and has a larger distribution within Ontario. However, regardless of whether you are operating close to a detection zone, we strongly suggest that you complete regular monitoring for BTM in relation to your boxwoods. And uh, what we're going to talk about today is going to help with that. So starting with the egg masses, I know that these can be difficult to scout for due to their color and flat profile against the surface of the leaf. However, there are a few tips that you can use to help identify them. Egg masses are most commonly laid on the underside of leaves. And so by lifting up that branch um, of the boxwood, you can often get a good look at all of those uh, undersides, like the photo here. In this photo, all of those red areas are actually pointing towards an egg mass. And you can see that they vary in color. When they're first laid, they're a pale yellow, but as they mature, they darken in yellow. And then right before um, the larva hatch, there's actually this visible black dot in the center. And uh, this is actually the head capsule of the larva that's visible through that egg, um, egg sac, which is really interesting. So you can use these as a way to help you ID the eggs. 
Moving on to the BTM larva, they have a black head capsule, green body, and there are black stripes that run along the length of the larva. The larva move through seven different growth stages, which we call instars, and uh, they're roughly shown here, moving from right to left. At egg hatch, the larvae are only a few millimeters in length, but can grow up to four centimeters uh, by that seventh instar. This is the stage that's going to feed on the host on the boxwood leaves. For the BTM pupa, they also change in color as they mature. They start out uh, representing the colors that match the larva, that light green with the vis visible black stripes. But again, as they mature, they're going to reflect the coloring closer to the adult with that black and white modeling. And uh, you can actually see that coloration, which will be visible on the adult wing. For the adult stage, we have only found the dominant light morph here in Ontario, which is the top photo. But I just want everyone to be aware that there is a melanic morph, which is a solid brown color that is present in both Asia and Europe, but again, has not been found here in Ontario. If you are keeping an eye out for these, um, the moths are nocturnal flyers, so you're going to see them more commonly flying at dawn and dusk. Now, BTM does overwinter in its larval stage. This is usually in the third instar. The larva will construct cocoons, which are uh, web webbing that's made between boxwood leaves, and we call this overwintering structure a hibernaria. These can be seen as early as August, but definitely more so in September and as we head into the fall and winter. The hosts for BTM are all species within the genus Buxus. This is what we call boxwood here in North America. At nurseries, boxwoods are commonly grown in containers and spaced within a hoop house, which is shown here on the left. However, in the landscape, um, these plant these plants are put together and form hedges, which is very common and shown on the right. So let's move into some more detailed monitoring actions that we can take. This handy infographic that I made just gives us an overview of the BTM's life stage through, throughout the year. A reminder that there are two complete generations that occur from early from fall to early spring, the young larva can be found in the overwintering structure, that hibernaria I was talking about. But as the temperatures warm in early May, larva will emerge and begin feeding on those boxwood leaves again. This first generation of larva can cause the most damage and are at peak activity roughly from May to June, and then will reach adulthood, that moth stage in early July. After eggs are laid by this first generation, the second generation of larvae emerge, feed, and peak from mid-July to mid-August. The adults of that second generation will occur in early September. Now, there will be larvae that will emerge from eggs that are laid by that second generation of adults in September. These are not considered a third generation because they don't complete the entire life cycle within the year. The larvae that are present in September will remain small because their primary goal is to overwinter. These larvae will be constructing their overwintering structure, that hibernaria, and exist for the rest of the year moving into and continuing to the next year, and the cycle starts again. Now, when we're thinking about uh, what action specifically to take to inspect, I have a great video here which demonstrates what I want everyone to do. As you can see, plants can often look unaffected from the exterior, but as you pull back the branches, 
we're going to start noticing some of those signs and symptoms of BTM presence. This is that dusty, damaged uh, look that we're seeing in the interior. This is because we can detect BTM uh, larvae have chewed and consumed foliage, leaving behind that debris. There's webbing and there's also frass trapped in that webbing. So this is a still image from that video and I'm showing it again to really drive home the importance of opening up that box with canopy. Um, it's a great tool and something I really want everyone to implement when we're talking about the actions to take for um, inspecting and monitoring. We want to be physically moving apart the canopy to reveal any signs and symptoms, any life stages that might be present on the plant. So I'm gonna run through a little bit of an activity here. I, I want everyone to take a second, lean in and really study this photo. There are multiple pieces which we can use to help ID BTM presence here. I'll take a second and let everyone do that. All right, so, through these arrows, I have highlighted two instances, both on the left and the right, where we can actually see BTM larva in the photo. The arrow at the top of the photo is pointing towards feeding damage. And lastly, highlighted in that red circle is a hibernaria. It can be difficult to spot, but as you get more comfortable with what it looks like, I guarantee you you'll be finding these as well. Um, the hibernaria can, um, or a helpful tip to identify the hibernaria is you're gonna see two boxwood leaves, two or more I should say, that are squished together. And then there's actually some webbing that you can see there on that leaf margin. Um, so if you were to open this up, there's a great chance that you're gonna see a BTM larva inside. Another way that we can identify BTM presence if we're not actually finding the life stages is looking at and identifying the different types of uh, foliar damage that we're seeing. Young immature larvae are going to be creating something that we call window pane damage. And this is because with their small mandibles, they can only eat a single layer of the leaf. Now that photo on the left, if you were to hold this branch up to a light source like the sun, you're going to be able to see right through that leaf layer. Compare this to the mature larval feeding that is pictured on the right. This is where the larvae are consuming the entire leaf and only leaving maybe the, var uh, the margins or the veins. And after a few weeks, this desiccation looks a lot like the skeletonized branches um, that we can classify this damage as. So now that we've looked at what damage um, looks like close up, let's take a step back. What can it look like from a distance? Well, as you can see in the photo on the right, severe damage is really striking. This is you know, almost complete defoliation and desiccation of the leaves. There is a thick layer of webbing that stretches across the entire hedge. And uh, this was taken, this photo was taken in the landscape, something that I hope no one will ever experience, but it is possible. I'm using this only to contrast the much more common damage that we see, which is minor to moderate, which is the photo on the left. Here, you can identify a few pieces of desiccated leaves and maybe even a, a bare piece of branch, which is in the top right, where there might be some more severe defoliation happening. But overall, there's still lots of green material here. This is much more common uh, level of damage that we're seeing. Jumping back to life stages, I want to just highlight a few um, techniques and areas that you should be monitoring for each, indi each individual stage. For BTM pupa, 
the larva, as they're getting ready to pupate, will tend to create a sheltered space, webbing together either green foliage or dead foliage. So this is what those two photos are demonstrating here. This is another great reason why it's so important to physically move that plant canopy apart because you could be exposing the BTM pupa which are sheltered inside. Another great tool for BTM ID are the pupil cases that are left behind. That pupil case is highlighted here in that red circle. These cases are light brown and paper thin, but will cling on to the plant material and persist for a long period of time, which can be a great ID tool. Also related to pupa, it's important to keep the area around your boxwood plants free of debris. In severe defoliation cases where there are no boxwood leaves present, as seen in the landscape sometimes, BTM can seek shelter in nearby plant debris, such as fallen leaves, as seen in the photo here on the right, where the BTM larvae are preparing to pupate within this sycamore leaf. Again, I do really want to stress that is that this is not commonly seen, but does highlight the importance of keeping the areas around your boxwood plants free of debris. Another reason to keep the area around your plants clear is that uh, you may actually see a collection of frass, which is the larval excrement, collecting underneath the plants. Now, this could happen both in the landscape or in nursery settings, like the photo on the right with that container and the collection of frass that you can see on um, the landscaping fabric. Just in general, frass, which is usually green to brown and pellet shaped, is a great ID tool. It can be caught in the webbing and uh, it indicates that there's BTM presence on that plant material. Lastly, but not least, um, definitely webbing can also be a great ID tool. It uh, indicates, you know, the also the degree of the infestation um, and will reflect the population density to some degree. Something that I also want everyone to keep in mind uh, in general during your monitoring, it's very important that you're aware of all of the other problems that plants might have. In this case, there are two different types of pests that are common on boxwood here in Ontario and that is boxwood psyllids, which is shown on the left, and boxwood leaf miner, shown on the right. Starting with the boxwood psyllids, uh, the biggest difference between how it presents on the plant compared to BTM is that psyllids usually uh, show up on the newest plant material at the start of May and look like white powdery clumps. Um, this is because those psyllids, which are a second insect pest, very similar to aphids, cover themselves with this powder and it gives them sort of this um, a hydrophobic quality. Um, again, just keep in mind that these are not BTM eggs and a completely different pest. For the boxwood leaf miners, um, these are a type of um, midge, a type of fly, where the larva is actually contained within the leaf. And that's what's shown here at the bottom. Um, the key difference here is that although the boxwood leaves do look brown, which could be desiccation, um, you do see this blistering type of pattern. And uh, the leaf in this case remains intact. There is no visible margins of chewing or damage. But if you were to open up these leaves, you're going to see some really striking orange, bright orange larva. And that's actually the boxwood leaf miner. Um, also, just natural desiccation occurs. So just be aware of what that looks like as well. Um, something to be aware of is to not confuse spider egg sacs with BTM eggs or the overwintering stage of BTM. Uh, 
in the photo here, we can see that there's some webbing and we might question, well, is this BTM? But in this case, we can clearly see that there's a shed spider skin here. Again, if you are finding any sort of web structure on your boxwoods, just open it up. And if you do see any sort of eggs or collection um, of what you would consider eggs, know that BTM eggs will never be contained in any sort of webbing. And so this would most likely be a spider egg sac. All right, with that, all of that information in mind, I'm going to hand it over to Cassie, and she's going to run through some different pheromone traps and uh, also comment on management. Awesome. Thanks, Abby. Okay, so uh, I don't think we can talk about scouting without talking about pheromone traps since they are an excellent tool to add to your scouting toolbox. You should be installing these pheromone traps uh, about the first week of May, uh, checking them regularly, uh, weekly actually, and keeping them up until the end of September. If you're using traps in an indoor setting like a heated poly or greenhouse, that window should actually be extended from about April 1st to October 15th. You do have some options available for traps. Um, research has found that these uni traps pictured here on the right are your best bet. We do uh, have the green one pictured, but you can use the clear, white, or yellow ones. Um, come in a couple different colors, um, but color isn't terribly important. The uni traps are accompanied by a pheromone lure specific to box tree moth. You do have a couple options uh, for lures as well. So there are these rubber septa pheromones at the top um, corner there, and they last about four weeks. Uh, there's also a gel pheromone, uh, which is in a lure syri or a syringe, and they last about three months, so they don't require being changed as often. And then there is a development of an eight-month lure, uh, but as of the recording of this webinar, I don't believe it is available in Canada yet. Um, the lures, they go into the little top chamber of the uni trap pictured there, um, and you can either use a kill strip like vapor tape uh, or a sticky card in the bottom of the trap to uh, catch the moths that enter. Be sure to replace the, um, the uh, lures as uh, instructed on the package. Um, and then again, the vapor tape also is instructed, I believe it's every 16 weeks. Uh, especially important to remember that when handling pheromones, make sure you wear gloves. Uh, this is for contamination purposes uh, and gloves also if you're handling kill strips just for safety. And links where you can buy these materials are included on the Box Tree Moth BMPs posted on the Landscape Ontario website. Um, I will include a link to that after uh, we post the recording of this webinar. And um, you can also just contact your local retailer like Royal Brinkman and Salida, uh, Great Lakes IPM. There's, there's a number of places where you can buy these uh, pheromone monitoring traps. Next slide, please. There we go. Okay, so pheromone traps are best to be placed around the perimeter of uh, host plant production areas at a density of four traps per hectare or spaced at no less than one every 100 meters. Pheromone traps should also be placed within any pest exclusion areas as pictured on the right there. And if you click, Abby, there's actually should be a little circle that comes up. <laughs> there we go. Awesome. Um, so it is best to hang those traps about one meter above the crop. Um, if you're in a field situation and you don't have somewhere to hang them from, you can buy stakes or poles to hang those traps. Um, it's just really important you make sure that the trap is right above or really close to uh, where the host plants are. Once you have these traps up, you should be checking them weekly, as I mentioned. Um, so you screw the bottom uh, bucket off and you can empty them out to count how many moths and make sure you keep record of every time you check the traps and the number of moths captured. Um, it is important, and I just wanted to mention too, that these traps are not going to pull box tree moth to your facility like a magnet. Instead, they're just gonna attract any moths uh, that are in the immediate area. So again, just a great, um, a great monitoring tool to have. Next slide, please. Okay, just to start wrapping up here, I do have a few slides on management options for box tree moth. Uh, none of this should be terribly new information, just a quick refresher to those that need it. Um, again, just highlighting the need to use both pheromone traps and scouting uh, to help determine presence and timing for optimal box tree moth management. 
When you're using chemical controls, proper scouting will help you target the right stage of this pest, which is going to be those early and star larvae. For commercial growers in Ontario, you do actually have two um, currently registered insecticide groups um, that you can use. So it is important to make sure you're rotating between those groups for resistance management. Um, with any products for box tree moth, coverage is also gonna be really important. Um, and this means adequate water volumes to coat the leaves and, and make sure you're penetrating into the, the canopy of larger plants. And with any management actions, uh, making sure you're keeping record of those actions and following up to determine how successful they are with more scouting. Um, and Abby provided this great picture on the right here. You can see there is a dead BTM larva that has succumbed to some insecticide applications. Um, so then you, you know, you see that, you know that your products are working. All right, next slide. So here we have a table of the currently registered products for box three moth. Um, firstly, we have Delta Guard active uh, Delta Methrin, which is a group three contact insecticide. Note that this is currently just under an emergency use registration um, and applicable to outdoor grown boxwood at commercial facilities in Ontario. So uh, the emergency use does expire in June, but we should have an extension in place well before it does expire uh, with the goal of having it on as a permanent label expansion. And then we also have our box tree, or sorry, our BT products, including uh, Dipels, Antari, and Biotech Plus. All those are group 11s. They are available for commercial nurseries and uh, BT is also on the allowable list so it can be used in residential settings. Uh, there is also, I just want to mention work to try and get um, BTM on the label of the another insecticide called Avid, which is a group six. Uh, we are still working through that process. So I don't have specific timelines yet to provide, but I uh, just want to let everyone know that that is something that is being worked on. Next slide, please. And then here we just have um, this, or sorry, that information I just presented, um, but as an infographic. So Abby's put together this excellent life cycle diagram. And then we've included at the bottom, just the control option timings. Uh, so similar information here, um, essentially Delta Methrin or BT products. Again, you're really trying to target those early instars. Delta Methrin will have a bit better residual than a BT product, so it does open up your coverage window a little bit, um, but it's just really critical to make sure you're targeting uh, the correct stage for any product you're using. Um, something also to remember with BT is uh, it doesn't have much residual, so um, try not to apply it on a hot sunny day um, or before forecasted rain. Um, so if you do have those conditions, um, you just do have to, it means you'll have to shorten your reapplication window. And next slide, I think that brings us to the end of the presentation. Um, can open up the floor for questions. And we did have a couple questions in the chat that I'll just um, read out here. So maybe I'll give this one to Abby first. Um, are there any other plants uh, that box tree moth target? It, the short answer for that is no. And uh, the, bit, the longer answer is that I have, part of my graduate work was assessing that. Um, so I've run different laboratory trials um, involving two different euonymus species, euonymus alatus, which is what we call burning bush, and then euonymus fortunii, which doesn't have a great common name here in Ontario. Um, but within the laboratory setting, I fed these two different euonymus plants to Bostromoth larvae, and the conclusion from those experiments were that it did not survive or develop on those different plant species. Um, there's also work out of Europe, which demonstrates a few other plants, both um, holly and other euonymus plants, which may have been some concern or you may have heard of concerns about that in those experiments as well. Um, BTM larva could not survive or develop on those plants. So no, there are no other posts that you should be concerned about other than boxwood. Excellent. Um, and just one other question that was in the chat, will pruning help? That's a great question. Um, so in Europe, uh, there are some actions being taken to really drastically cut 
boxwood plant material right down to the base. But I believe that those actions are to promote long-term survival of the plant. Um, by removing the foliage completely, you're removing the food source for box tree moth. And so in those cases, they're really hoping that by severe pruning, you're going to be uh, maintaining that survival for the long term, short term, year to year management, or just targeting um, the different generations here in Ontario. We have not seen that pruning itself is an effective management tool. And uh, maybe you can comment on that as well. Yeah, I think you covered. Uh, I think you covered it well there, Abby. I don't really have anything much else to add. <laughs> um, so there aren't any other questions. Uh, did you have any final thoughts you wanted to add, Abby, before we sign off? Yeah, thank you. Um, I just really want to stress to everyone the importance of opening up that boxwood canopy. It, it's not enough to do kind of the flyby check with your eyes. Oh yeah, that plant material looks great. And I'm talking both in the nursery and in the landscape. If, uh, if you have clients that have boxwood, I really encourage everyone in the landscape as well um, to, to open up that canopy, really move it apart, interact with that material, the plant material, um, as I stated, you're going to be exposing the damage, the signs and symptoms. You could be pulling apart that sheltered cocoons for both the overwintering stage and the pupa. And then just in general, um, uh, this is maybe, you know, towards early infestation, but they can be quite conspicuous. So just, again, that interaction is that really key piece. You're going to be gaining a lot more information. So your uh, monitoring is going to be more effective in the long term. Excellent point. I uh, echo that entirely. So um, just want to thank, uh, before we go, thank everyone for tuning in today. Um, this recording will be available on the On Nursery Crops uh, blog um, and linked on YouTube as well. We hope it uh, serves as a really helpful training tool. And just want to say thank you again to Abby for joining us and giving this awesome presentation. Um, so thank you, everyone. Happy spring and take care.